when you have high levels of trauma, you get high levels of cortisol. And we know that cortisol alone, so like researchers just recently in the last couple of years did some studies where they put mitochondria in a Petri dish and they just saw them churning out ATP, doing their thing, going along. And they squirted a little bit of cortisol in and they started hyper producing ATP. So it means that you're revving up the engine. The cortisol is revving up the engine. And again, we want that. This is a good thing because it gives us energy to fight and flee. And it will, it will stimulate processes that then result in higher levels of glucose so that because we need that glucose to go run. We need to run from what, whoever is traumatizing us. And, uh, and so we need that glucose. We need the higher heart rate. We need the higher blood pressure. These are all good adaptive things in the moment. But when it goes on for a prolonged period of time, that's where this reactive oxygen species comes in. Now you, you, you're hyper-stimulating these mitochondria. They're running on overtime. They're trying their best to keep up. But electrons start leaking out. They're still being told, keep going, keep going. Don't slow down. Don't recover. Don't, don't try to repair yourselves. Don't, don't stop. We, 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 we're, we're fighting for our life. We are fighting for our life. You've got to keep going. Keep pushing, keep pushing, keep pushing. And the mitochondria are doing their thing. They're trying to save our lives. <laughs> they're, try, they're trying to put, do their share, but they start getting exhausted, so to speak, if you, if you, if you will. Like I forgive the, you know, the scientists will, will recoil at these kind of analogies and euphemisms and other things I'm using, but but I'm trying to make this understandable, and that is really understandable. Think of mitochondria as an engine. You're revving the engine. You're revving it. You're revving it too hard. You're pushing it too hard. You're not giving it a chance to recover. You're not giving it a chance to cool down. And acid starts leaking out. And now the acid is now damaging the very engine that's trying to save your life. And that is, again, when it comes to mitochondria, we can loosely refer to it as mitochondrial dysfunction. And now the very engines that are trying to save us, trying to give us enough energy to fight for our lives, are becoming damaged and dysregulated. The unfortunate news is that there are lots of biological, psychological, and social factors that play a role in mitochondrial function or metabolism. So the, some of the basic ones are diet or nutrition, but this includes vitamin deficiencies, nutrient deficiencies. Can Because mitochondria need a lot of the vitamins and nutrients that we've heard of are actually critical to mitochondrial function. It's actually mind-boggling how much of what we consume flows through mitochondria. The calories that we're consuming are all flowing for the most part. Most of them, I shouldn't say all, most of them are flowing through mitochondria. Um, the, so that means all the different nutrients, the carbohydrates, the protein, the fats, they're flowing through mitochondria. Um, the, uh, but a lot of the vitamins, um, vitamin B12, folate, uh, other things are required. They are required for mitochondrial function. Exercise directly impacts mitochondrial function. Sleep directly impacts mitochondrial function. Sleep does a lot more than that. And obviously, all of these things do more than just specific to mitochondria. But mitochondria are actually kind of the unifying link of biological, psychological, and social factors. Light exposure, circadian rhythms, drug and alcohol use, toxin exposure, whether it's microplastics, whether it's arsenic or cyanide, all of these are mitochondrial toxins. And so a wide range of things, infections, it's probably important to mention infections because that gets into like how would long COVID cause a mental illness? A lot of people would think, well, that has nothing to do with metabolism. And what I would say is that it has everything to do with metabolism. That the infection itself 
is causing mitochondrial dysfunction. And that is why people, that's why some people who don't get the mitochondrial dysfunction can fight off an infection and live happily ever after and never have any serious symptoms of a mental illness. But people who maybe are vulnerable, maybe because of childhood trauma or a poor diet or some other things, people who are vulnerable, they get an infection with COVID, for example, and they might get pushed over the edge. They might get pushed over the edge with mitochondrial dysfunction because their mitochondria are kind of a little vulnerable anyway. And now there's yet another assault on them and that pushes people over the edge. And then unfortunately, even after you fought off the virus, you may have symptoms for months or sometimes years. We kind of talked about stress trauma. There are lots of other psychological social factors that influence it, but the easiest way to think about most of the psychological and social factors is through stress pathways and trauma pathways. That it they, they all converge in that way. But it's all of the usual things. So if you're being bullied and teased relentlessly on the playground, yes, that's stress or trauma. If you're lonely, nobody pays attention to you. That is traumatic or stressful for a lot of people. Um, and, and on and on and on. 